I'd like to begin with a story some of you may have heard. In Soviet Russia, it is forbidden for a Jew to have a bris, ritual circumcision, performed on a newborn son. The punishment for having an infant son circumcised was immediate layoff from work, with the possibility of subsequent criminal charges, trials, and perhaps even a jail sentence. For this reason, the great majority of Jewish boys born in, Russia, in Soviet Russia remain uncircumcised. Nevertheless, some Jews take the risk of gathering a few highly trusted friends and having the bris performed clandestinely. clandestinely. Although a bris should be performed on the eighth day of a child's life, many times parents wait three weeks, three months, or even six months before they can accomplish what is for them a risky mitzvah. For the first few weeks after the birth of a son, parents could almost feel the presence of the authorities, and no hint of a brisk can even be mentioned. I'm getting there. <laughs> The family watches not only for the officials, but for friends who might actually be informers. In one particular town, there was the trusted million of people whom the Schneider family wished to invite to their son's bris. They were discreet, dependable, and responsible people. They would never betray a family, and no police authority could get any information from them. Often it was one of these men who advised the family when it was safe to have a bris. The Schneider boy was almost a year old, and he had not yet been circumcised. Suddenly, the atmosphere became a bit less tense, and Mr. Schneider was informed that it was safe to have the bris. The mall was called, the guests gathered in the basement, and the child was brought there to have his bris. The bris was performed, the proper blessings were recited, and everyone wished each other mazel The child was then brought back to the room where his mother was waiting for him. Suddenly, there was a piercing scream, a wail, and a cry. There was a, there was a thud, as though, as, as though someone had fallen to the floor. Pandemonium broke out as people ran to the room where the mother lay in a dead faint. After they revived her, she told over an incredible story. The young mother feared that her son might never have a wrist, that she would be lulled into negligence because of a fear of the authorities that she may capitulate to fear and not have the bris at all. She was determined not to let that happen to herself, and she undertook something that would compel her to long for the bris. To make it paramount in her mind at all times, she vowed not to kiss her son until he had had his bris. For close to a year, she suffered the pent-up emotions that only a mother can feel. Finally, after the bris, she had taken her son into her aching arms and kissed him fervently. Overcome with emotion, she had fainted. This love of performing mitzvot can be seen today too. Did you ever witness someone who never experienced a Shabbos in their life, lighting Shabbos candles for the very first time, as tears well up in their eyes, as they do what their great-grandmothers and their mothers before them have done in years gone by, or to see the glow on the faces of children at the Shabbos table at a Shabbat home? Or how about a young man born in Russia, raised on a steady diet of communist propaganda, purchasing a pair of tefillin and putting them on every morning? How can we motivate ourselves and our fellow Jews to do mitzvot and come closer to Hashem? Why does it feel peculiar at times to observe some of the mitzvot? The Torah tells us that Moshe Rabbeinu, Moses our teacher, died in the desert, in the desert, and did not men, and, did, and did not merit entering the land of Israel. The Medrash explains that Moshe ran away from Egypt after killing an Egyptian who was attacking a Jew. Moshe traveled to Midian, the country of his future wife. Moshe goes to the well and sees the town shepherds tormenting the, the local girls and throwing them into the well. Moshe comes to the rescue and helps them. They go, they go home and they tell their father Yisro that an Egyptian saved us from the hands of the shepherds. 
because Moshe remained silent and didn't correct them by saying, I'm an Ivri, a Hebrew, in other words, a Jew, he lost his merit to enter the land of Israel. Perhaps one can ask, why was Moshe at fault? He was in a land where no one practiced Judaism. As a matter of fact, there weren't, any, there weren't even any Jews living there. He was afraid to reveal his true identity. He was, in, he was in an unknown land. Why was such a harsh punishment warranted? It seems from the Medrash that had Moshe felt a bit more exhilarated over the fact that he was a Jew, he would have corrected Yusuf's daughters when he was referred to as an Egyptian and would have said, no, I'm an Ivri, a Jew. Can we say that Moshe was lacking in his identity as a Jew? After all, he was living in power of the king of Egypt's palace. He was living in royalty. And he gave it all up by killing the Egyptians to help another Jew. Can there be any greater commitment to the Jewish people? Yet somewhere deep down, there was an infinitesimal bit, la bit lacking, which caused him to be fearful and remain silent about his Jewish identity. Had he come into Midian with more vigor regarding his heritage, he would have had the wherewithal to proudly state, I'm an Ivri, a Hebrew, a Jew. The majority of the Jewish people in America don't observe any of the rituals. Many of our Jewish neighbors and Jewish friends are unfamiliar with Jewish laws and customs, so it might feel awkward and foolish to be different by carrying out the Torah's commandments. But if we are truly proud of who we are, the children of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, that we are the chosen people that God took out of Egypt with amazing miracles and gave us the Torah and we realize how fortunate we are to be a part of the Jewish nation imbued with the special love from Hashem and the connection we have with one another, we would be undaunted and have a powerful desire to follow in God's ways. We have to ingrain into our children this concept of how special we are. When the Jewish holidays come around, we have to tell our children the true meaning how each holiday isn't just a vacation from school. It's not just as, as the saying goes, they tried to kill us, we won, let's eat. But it's to remind us of Hashem's love for us. When we learn about Passover, we have to feel, and we have the capacity to feel grateful even 3,000 years after coming out of Egypt for all that God did for us. All the miracles that were done in Egypt and by, by the splitting of the sea demonstrate to us how Hashem manipulates the world and watches over us with his, divine guide, with his divine guidance. Last Hanukkah, the Jewish exponent called and said that they were writing an article about Hanukkah and that they would like for me to tell them what we do for Hanukkah. I said that we tell our children that during the time of Hanukkah, the Syrian Greeks will not allow our people to fulfill the mitzvot or to study Torah. And a battle ensued and miraculously the Jewish people won the war. If the Jewish people would have agreed not to study Torah and not to do mitzvot, the Greeks wouldn't have harmed us. On Hanukkah, we were fighting for our spiritual survival. So we have to glean from the story of Hanukkah how precious mitzvot are, how much more effort we need to put into Torah study. I'm not sure why, but I didn't see it in the paper the following week. If we teach our children about Hashem and the Torah, the book that contains the formula for happiness, we will find direction and purpose and meaning in our lives that will be most fulfilling. If a person only focuses on materialism, then when he doesn't reach his goal, he'll fall into a state of misery and grief. And in truth, there is no goal, for one is never satisfied. Our children here is constantly telling them to do well in school, to get into the best college, to get the best job, to make the most money, to be able to buy everything and go on the best vacations. Is there any question why teenage depression is on the rise? They don't see any purpose in life if it's all just to become rich and die. But if you bring the Torah into our homes and show them how to see Hashem's hand guiding us, they'll feel purpose and meaning which brings happiness and satisfaction which lasts forever. We hope and pray that we continue our mission to bring Torah to Bucks County and grow together in our Torah and Mitzvah observance. Thank you very much.